So my job this afternoon is actually pretty easy. I just get to tell you a story. And it's a little bit self-indulgent, but at the end of that story, I want to share with you what is probably the biggest takeaway for me over my approximately 15-year mountaineering career. So it's a story or a narrative whose literal high point was on this date here, the 17th of May 2010, so about three and a half years ago, when I was very fortunate to be one of the few West Australians to stand on the actual summit, sit as it were, on the actual summit of Mount Everest. Now, I don't want you to go away thinking this is something I decided to do one day and a few weeks later I went and did it. It was a 10-year project, so I'm going to take you on that journey today. Now, I'm a Perth boy, so you might be wondering how on earth do you go on to become a high-altitude mountaineer? Perth is not the most conducive breeding environment for mountaineers. But I was very fortunate because my mum and dad had a real love of the outdoor environment. And they tried to instill that into all of their four kids. So most of our school holidays were spent camping either in the southwest or the northwest of the state. So I grew to love the outdoor environment. It led me to studying environmental science here at the University of Western Australia. Now, at the end of my first year of university, mum and dad decided that the family home was getting a bit cramped with four young adults. It was time to kick them out. But before doing so, they'd take us on one final family holiday together. And we travelled to the South Island of New Zealand. We embarked on some of the classic mountain walks, the Milford Track, the Rootburn Track and the Kepler Track. If you're, a, if you're a mountain lover, you might have heard of those walks. So surrounded by stunning mountain scenery, I felt for the first time in my life, I knew exactly where I belonged, the mountains. I found it a little bit limiting walking through the mountains, being surrounded by amazing snow-capped peaks. We actually couldn't go up amongst them. You need to have specialist skills. And so I decided then and there that as a reward for finishing my university degree, I would come back to New Zealand. And I did that three years later. And I completed a technical mountaineering course where you learn the basic skills to, to be able to survive in what is sometimes a dangerous alpine environment. This photograph is taken on that climbing course. A copy of the picture takes pride of place over my mum and dad's dining room table. Now, a number of their friends have commented over the years, wow, you know, your son must be so brave. But what they don't know in this photograph is that I am quite literally sobbing because the drop on either side of that ridge was so severe. Turns out I'm terrified of heights. <laughs> a slight impediment to my then burgeoning mountaineering career. I had read all the books. I had romanticised about it a lot. But in reality, it was far different. Very difficult. The first few years of my mountaineering career, a lot of it was about learning to overcome that irrational fear, which is essentially what a fear of heights is. So I used mountaineering as a fantastic way to travel the world. Once a year, I'd take all of my annual leave and embark off to a different continent, a different culture, on a different mountaineering expedition. So it's been very re rewarding for me, allowing me to travel to many different countries, most of the continents. But what I found more than anything was my real love was in the Himalayas, the highest mountain range on Earth, and I loved climbing in Nepal, Tibet, and Pakistan. So by about 2006, I had started working towards my goal of climbing Mount Everest. I had sat down and mapped out a series of mountains which, if I could climb, each one progressively higher than the last one, that would give me sufficient skill to hopefully get to the summit of Everest. So I turned my attention in 2006 to this mountain here. It's called Amma de Blam. It stands at 6,850 metres, just down the valley from Mount Everest. It's a very steep technical mountain. For a guy who's horrified of heights, when I first saw this mountain, I, I have to admit, I think I started crying again. But it doesn't matter. I didn't need to worry about that because I didn't get anywhere near the summit. At a much lower altitude of about 6,000 metres, I developed a very serious altitude illness known as pulmonary edema where due to the lack of oxygen and lack of pressure that you get at altitude, my lungs started filling with fluid. High altitude pulmonary edema. It's an insidious disease and it will kill you very quickly. The only treatment for this disease is to descend as quickly as you can. But at 6,000 metres in altitude, the air is too thin for a helicopter to, to perform a rescue. The rotor blades can't get any purchase in the thin air. But fortunately, two strong teammates were able to assist me back down the mountain, taking about nine hours to get me back into base camp. But I wasn't out of the woods just yet. Base camp for Amitabh Lam is at about 5,000 metres. 
I was placed in this red tube here, which is known as a Gamov bag. It's named after the Russian inventor. It's a sealed tube. You lie inside that bag, and you can see my buddy on the left there. He pumps that foot pump. It blows air into the sealed bag, increasing the pressure, thereby effectively simulating a lower altitude. And it drop, effectively drops you by about 2,000 metres or so. So it's a very restrictive space. You lie in that Gamov bag. You can't move your legs or your arms. You've got a small perspex window to look out of. I was in that Gamov bag for about seven hours. So by the time I was let out of that Gamov bag, I had yet another chronic phobia to contend with. <laughs> I'm pretty much afraid of everything. <laughs> so whilst the rest of my teammates were moving on up the mountain to try and get to the summit, I had to leave the expedition to return back to Australia to recover. Now, I was really quite overwhelmed because, firstly, I'd, I'd almost lost my life. But secondly, I was really overwhelmed by a sense of failure. Once you've had an altitude illness, anecdotally, the evidence suggests that you're more prone to getting it again. And so, for all intents and purposes, the Everest stream was really over before it had begun. So this last day in the mountains, Everest, you'd normally be able to see her hiding uh, on the left-hand side of that photo, but she was hiding behind the clouds all day. I got to the final bend in the path above the town of Nampshi, where you do get your last classic view of Mount Everest. It was late in the afternoon into the evening, and I remember thinking, I'm going to turn around one last time. I know that I'm not going to be able to see Mount Everest, and I'll take that as a sign to put this, what was essentially a stupid idea, to bed. I turned around and was quite surprised to see the summit of Everest just poking up there in the distance. There may have been angels singing at that point in time, I'm not sure. <laughs> but it was a very strong moment for me. I thought, OK, let's not give this, let's not put this idea to bed just yet. But I returned to Australia and I recuperated. It was about 18 months before I went back into the mountains. And I needed to go back to a similar altitude to that where I'd had the illness. So I'm returning to the mountains very tentatively. And it's this one here. It's called Denali. It's the highest peak in North America. It stands at about 6,200 metres in altitude, so a similar altitude to where I'd had the illness. It's one of the highest freestanding mountains in the world. Base camp is at 2,000 metres, the summit more than four vertical kilometres up. It's also one of the coldest mountains in the world. It lies only 100 miles south of the Arctic Circle. We climb it in the summer months. We don't have to take a head torch because we have 24 hours of light. But despite this, it's still incredibly cold. I remember one morning waking up in our tents and it's minus 20 degrees inside the tent, let alone outside. Now, when it's this cold, as you can imagine, everything freezes. Your food freezes, your water freezes, your toothpaste, your sunburn cream, your camera batteries, your clothes, your boots, things that you didn't know could freeze, freeze. <laughs> so you can see what I'm doing. I'm gradually acquiring a skill set which is going to serve me on Everest because Everest is likewise a particularly cold mountain. Three and a half weeks into the expedition, I'm lucky enough to stand on the summit. So at last, on my third big mountain expedition, I got to experience that pure joy of 99% hard work and then this, this pure joy of looking around, seeing this amazing scenery and thinking, wow, it's all paid off. Now, given my track record to date, I hadn't been particularly successful on my big mountain expeditions. I didn't know if I was likely to be on the summit of a big peak anytime soon. So I thought, well, look, I'd better at least make the most of this opportunity. So we'll practice our various summit poses here. <laughs> That's my favourite one. It's the noble adventurer. <laughs> but I did feel that I was back on track for my Everest goal. And I continued to climb over the subsequent years, with my final training climb being on this mountain here. It's called Choi Oyu, and it's the sixth highest peak in the world. It stands at 8,000. 201 metres. And I just had to throw this photograph in because this is the best photo I've ever taken in my climbing life. At an altitude of 8,000 metres, you may just be able to make out the curvature of the earth. And you can also see that large black shadow. That's the shadow of the mountain being projected more than 100 kilometres out into the atmosphere. So at last, I was ready to give Everest a crack. So how do we go about doing that? Well, first of all, we fly to Nepal in the capital city, Kathmandu. From there, we take a small plane flight to the mountain village of Lukla. Lukla is the gateway to the Everest Valley. And for the next six to eight weeks, we're on foot, spending 10 to 11 days slowly trekking into base camp, taking our time to allow our bodies time to acclimatise to the chronic lack of oxygen at altitude. We finally arrive in base camp itself at an altitude of 5,300 metres. So more than five vertical kilometres up into the Earth's atmosphere, 
that is in itself a huge achievement, and, and for most people, that's the end goal. But for us as mountaineers, it's just the starting point. We're going to turn our attention higher up the mountain. Firstly, passing through what is probably the most dangerous feature of Everest, it's called the Icefall, a glacier which cascades down the side. Once we've passed through the ice, we, we, we establish our first camp at 6,100 metres. Our second camp is at 6,500 metres, still two and a half vertical kilometres below the summit of Everest, up on our left there. But we're actually going to divert out to the right now, to this mountain on the right. It's called Lhotse. It's the fourth highest peak in the world, and we have to climb that first of all. Halfway up Lhotse, we put our third camp at an altitude of 7,300 metres, and then our highest camp on the mountain, Camp 4, at 8,000 metres. So we call this the death zone, 8,000 metres. There's a third the amount of oxygen that there is at sea level. A very difficult environment and a true edge environment. This is the highest camp on the mountain. Looking to the left, the summit of Lhotse, panning back around to the right, we can see the final summit ridge of Mount Everest. That right-hand skyline ridge, it's the southeast ridge of Mount Everest, following the original route that Sir Ed Hillary in Tenzing, Norgay, took in 1953 when they were the first people to successfully climb to the top. Passing over the south summit, which is a minor summit, before finally making it to the main summit of Everest at 8,850 metres. So almost nine vertical kilometres up into the Earth's atmosphere. Standing on the summit of Everest, there is a quarter the amount of oxygen that there is here at sea level. So if we as an audience were lifted up to that altitude right now, we would be gasping for air straight away. We would be unconscious within 10 to 15 minutes and die not long after that. So how on earth do we actually go up this high? Well, what we need to do is we acclimatise lower down the mountain. We spend five to six weeks getting our bodies used to that lack of oxygen. From base camp, we'll pass through the ice fall up to camp one for the day, drop back down to base camp and rest for another day. Then it's on back up through the ice fall again to camp one for a night. We drop back down through the ice fall and rest. Back up through the ice fall, onto camp one for a night, camp two for three or four nights, drop back down the, through the ice fall and rest. Back up through the ice fall, camp one, camp two, one night at camp three, drop all the way back down to base camp and rest. Finally, we spend two weeks resting in base camp before our final summit push, taking us all the way up to camp four, onto the summit. So it's not an easy job, it's two months on the mountain. It's, it, there's no immediate return on Everest. So we're in base camp now. That's the summit of Everest, three and a half vertical kilometres higher in the top right-hand corner of that photograph. The bottom left-hand corner, you can see some yellow blotches. That's actually base camp there. If we zoom in on that, you can see it's quite a crowded affair. There's a lot of people wanting to climb Mount Everest, and there's generally only one season annually when you can do so, during the months of April and May, when the winds on the summit are not too strong. So in 2010, there were more than 30 expeditions on the mountain, so incredibly crowded. Now, unfortunately, a lot of climbers on Everest these days have not served the requisite mountaineering apprenticeship. They're big on dollars, but not so big on skills. They come to Everest, and more often than not, these are the climbers who lose their lives. When I was on Everest in 2010, four climbers lost their lives. Last year, 11 people died on Everest, including five on one day. So we're at the foot of the icefall. That's the icefall behind us. It's about five to 600 metres vertical elevation. And if we zoom in on that photograph, we can see the scale of it. Those two climbers in the middle, surrounded by huge towers of ice, which we call seracs. Seracs are inherently unstable. They have a tendency to topple over without any notice. So we need to move through the icefall as quickly as we can. We generally leave base camp at 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning when it's at its coldest, therefore it's most stable. Difficult to move quickly through the icefall, though, because of this broken-up nature of the terrain. And the other large difficulty being very large crevasses, huge gaps in the ice, some of which are bottomless. Well, they're black, so they appear to be bottomless. In some instances, we actually have to use ladders to get over these. So, first of all, we're going to cross a smaller crevasse. It's, it's black, so it's very, very deep. But fortunately, I'm six foot four and I've got long legs, so I can make my way across that one. But the next one is a little bit more imposing. <laughs> now, we've got a heavy backpack on, thick clothing, double layer boots, crampon spikes. Fortunately, I'm a size 12 shoe. That makes this a little bit easier. Now, every time you pass through the icefall, 
you would come across this scene probably about 30 occasions or so. So by the end of the expedition, you've done this hundreds and hundreds of times, and you're actually quite used to it. Then we arrive in our first camp on the mountain. Now, we're above Camp 2, headed up towards Camp 3, and you remember I, I told you that we're going to climb up Lhotse first of all, and so halfway up Lhotse there is our third camp. And if we zoom in on this photograph, we can see exactly what's going on. It's going to take us about nine hours to make our way up to the tents at the very top, but look, it's actually starting to get a little bit busy. Not what you'd expect to see on Everest. You can see the tents in the top left corner on the Lhotse face now, looking straight up, always keeping our eyes open for rock and ice, which can be knocked down from above, because looking back the other way, it's a pretty healthy 800-metre drop down that steep, icy slope. We arrive in our third camp at 7,300 metres. It's the simple things on Everest that keep us alive. It's the rope. I always stay attached to that rope. A number of climbers have lost their lives in Camp 3 over the years, having gotten up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet, not being clipped into a rope, and slipped and fallen to their deaths. So now we're on our final summit push. We've spent six weeks acclimatising up and down, up and down, up and down, and we've got a weather forecast which is telling us in a couple of days' time the wind is going to lift off the summit. So we actually use weather forecasts that commercial airline pilots use to, to fly efficiently between continents because they're the winds that are sitting on the summit of Everest. We need, we need that wind to lift off the top. So we've had the forecast, we're moving up towards Camp 4. And you can see here I'm wearing what is probably the biggest risk mitigator we can use on our summit push, and that's an oxygen mask and bottle. It doesn't make it climbing Everest much easier, but it certainly makes it safer, ensuring our respiratory and circulatory systems can continue to function. So let's have a look at just how difficult it is climbing at this extreme altitude. You can see how many steps I take before I'm absolutely exhausted. I think I get to four. Four steps and that's it. And if we can check the audio, please. I think we're down on the audio for this video. So that's how difficult climbing above 8,000 metres is. Four steps at a time. That's how we break down what would otherwise be an insurmountable, uh, difficult job of climbing. We chunk it down to four steps at a time. There we go. There's some audio. That's a bit more what it's like. So we arrive in our fourth camp, on the edge of the death zone at 8,000 metres. You can see two things of note. Firstly, that yellow tent has actually been torn by the wind. That's the reality of how strong these winds blow. But also, you can see that large pile of oxygen bottles. That suggests there's a large commercial expedition up in Camp 4, also targeting the same weather window. Now, I like to climb in small teams, just with some of my friends, we're much more agile and dynamic. I think it's a much safer way to climb. We don't want to get caught up in these larger expeditions, but it looks like that's what's going to happen. So it's an incredibly long night, leaving Camp 4 at 9 o'clock in the evening. That gives us enough time to climb through the night, get up to the summit the next day, and back to the relative safety of Camp 4 for the second night. It's minus 30 degrees now. We've been doing an oxygen kind of change over about five in the morning and it's just really, really hard. So an incredibly long night, climbing through the darkness, you can't see how far up the mountain you've gone, but it's when you get these first signs of sunshine on the eastern horizon, you know that you're getting closer and hopefully this is going to be the greatest day of your life. Looking out to the south now, you can see the monsoon storm clouds silently flashing away over India. And I remember being very moved, very privileged to be witnessing this incredible beauty. Looking down into Tibet, I remember seeing a light turn on and thinking, wow, there's a Tibetan farmer who's getting up for his day's work and little does he know that there's an Australian just below the summit of Everest spying down on him. So now we're passing over the south summit at 8,750 metres, so only 100 vertical metres left to go to the top. Now we have to make this very narrow tra traverse across this knife edge ridge. The summit in the distance, a 3,000 metre drop on the right hand side, a 2,500 metre drop on the left hand side. So quite difficult climbing as we make our way along this final summit ridge. Now, wearing a head cam gives you a great first-person perspective of what it's like. 
And for me, again, I was overcome by a sense of privilege. Following in the footsteps of all of my mountaineering forefathers, starting with Sir Ed Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, I felt very, very lucky to be up here, like a stairway through the heavens. Finally, we come to the last technical hurdle. It's a rock step, which is about 15 metres high. It's called the Hillary Step, named after Sir Ed. At sea level, you'd probably scamper up it in all of about 30 seconds. At this altitude, it takes about 15 minutes to get up it. That's the last technical hurdle. Once we're above that, the final summit slopes are quite benign, but you can see just how deprived of oxygen we are now. But we keep pushing on, and finally, after many, many years of hard work, we find ourselves taking those final steps up onto the summit of Mount Everest. Here we are, but I have to be honest, this is a scene I was not really expecting. Um, hello, everybody. This is 24 Pat other here. people on the summit. It's peak hour on summit, Mount Everest. Everest. We summited at 10.30 this morning, Nepal time. Um, so that's about quarter to one in the afternoon, Perth time. These are these incredible views you get from the very top. But what's particularly worrying is that wind and the cloud that is building up. We've got a storm on the way, so we cannot linger for long on the top. We take our photos and we get out of there. It's quite an unnerving feeling being on the summit of Everest. You certainly don't sit down and relax. You know that you've only got the job half done. It's like there's a doorway to the rest of your life and safety, and if you don't get back through that doorway before it closes, it's going to slam shut on you, and you'll be stuck up there for good. So it's almost a feeling of living on borrowed time. We take our photos and we get out of there. This is our last photograph from the top. Within a few minutes of this photo being taken, we were ensconced in a whiteout, so we couldn't see where we were going. 13 hours to get to the summit, another nine to get back down to the relative safety of Camp 4, another two days subsequent to that to finally step back into base camp. And that's when this huge sense of relief really washes over you. My very, very dear Sherpa friends there, five of us in the middle there, together, three days earlier, we'd been standing on the summit of Mount Everest, well supported by our base camp staff. This is my favourite photo from that expedition because it shows you what a team of individuals can do when they work together towards a goal. But ultimately, what does this mean? You might think, yeah, that's pretty cool, but so what? What can we learn from this? In the bigger context, my big takeaway is the benefits as an individual of taking yourself outside your comfort zone. That's where I think there is an immense capacity for self-awareness and self-growth. And at times when I get troubled where the direction humankind is headed, I think, well, if we can all take ourselves outside of our comfort zones, do away with complacency, I think we can all live a much better life. So thank you all. I hope you've enjoyed listening to me today.